on YouTube. Well, that's good. Well, now you'll now you'll be on there again. So yeah, please okay. by all means take it away, Bob. Thank you, Zach. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. And hats off to the work that you guys do, landowners, staff, volunteers throughout the the Lower Nehalem watershed. Um, at the upper one too. I mean, all the watershed councils are doing the Lord's work. And it's just watching uh, this tonight. Uh, I grew up down in North Bend, which is of course at the downstream end of the Coos watershed, but the habitat areas that you're showing and the, the work that you're doing, that's, that's my native habitat. That's what I grew up in. And uh, it just, it means a lot to me that people are taking the time and the effort to restore them because I'm at an age that when I was growing up down there in the 50s and early 60s, we didn't know what we were losing because of uh, the practices, the timber harvest practices and watershed practices. Uh, it, we had no idea. It just seemed like it was limitless and would go on forever. And then we found it wouldn't. So uh, I appreciate so much what you're doing. And, and uh, I, I would like to sort of frame what we're doing in, in a similar way. It's, um, as you'll see tonight, uh, this is not about restoring sea otters to the Oregon coast because they're cute and furry, although we're really grateful that these are a, a charismatic megafauna, as they say, and uh, cute and cuddly and people just love them. Uh, but we're interested in restoring them, restoring them because it's all about restoring and protecting the valuable nearshore habitat that the kelp forests and our estuarine eelgrass beds provide and we so that's our modus operandi and, and our our motivation so let me give a little brief introduction here to um, who we are and uh, why we're doing and then I'm going to lay out here the little bit of our story tonight it's long and complicated I don't know how many people have heard uh, my my or somebody else's sea otters 101 talk but there's a lot of chapters to this story. And so we're gonna walk through it pretty quickly to give you an overview. So the Alaka Alliance was conceived and uh, originally by Dave Hatch, a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians back in 98, 99. He was looking for the name, uh, a name for his little boat that he built and came up with Alaka, which is the uh, Clatsop uh, Chinook jargon word for sea otter. But uh, his effort was informal. He called it the Alaka Alliance for many years. Dave passed away, unfortunately, in 2017, or actually 2016. Uh, a bunch of us who had known Dave and had been infected with his idea uh, came together and formed this nonprofit in 2018. Uh, since then, we've, you know, we've trying to build an airplane to fly us on this mission. And one of the first things we did was to adopt a strategic plan after a six month process in 2019. And by tw April, 2020, we actually are a, a real 501 C3. So our vision is an Oregon coast 50 years from now where our children and grandchildren enjoy and benefit from the healthy sea otter population, a robust marine ecosystem and a thriving coastal economy. So that means our mission is to restore that healthy population of sea otters to Oregon and in the process help make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. And we'll talk about why that is here as we go along. But first I wanna start with the animal itself, uh, Alaka. This is a sea otter uh, in full, full on glory here. And again, Alaka is a sea otter, uh, the word for sea otter in the Chinook trade jargon they're the smallest of the marine mammals. The next largest uh, marine mammal is a harbor seal, and that's 350 pounds. But these guys are more like a, a big German shepherd dog. That's how I, I think of them. They're 60 to 80 pounds, maybe 100 pounds if you got a really big one. Uh, so they're not big animals at all. But they are three times the size of a river otter. And we'll talk about more, more about those differences with river otters in just a moment. These things are very social creatures. They hang out with a cohort of relatives and, and really friends their entire life. Uh, they hang out in large rafts. The males tend to congregate in their own raft, females, and uh, they're 
offspring in their, in their wrasse. They are unique among marine mammals in that the way that they stay warm in a very cold ocean is through their two ways. One is their extremely dense fur, uh, which is what got them in trouble. We'll, we'll talk about that. And they need to groom that fur frequently to keep air in it, which is it's really the air that, that is the insulating material. But the other way that they keep warm is that they stoke their metabolic fire uh, to a high degree. They actually, their temperature inside is warmer than ours. And they do that because of the outside cold temperatures. But that means that they've got to eat a third of their weight or so in uh, food every, every day. So they are eating machines and they harvest primarily shellfish. And why is that? Because shellfish are easy to catch and they're calorie rich. They have a high energy value and particularly in, in the crab and uh, clams, but as well as the uni in um, sea urchins. So they grab this stuff, take it to the surface, crack it open and eat it. And they do this a lot during the day. They've, they're built, they've adapted their uh, dental wear for crunching through tough shells. You can see the guy on the left. Their molars are, uh, and the skull on the right there, their molars are really for crushing shells as opposed to river otters that have tearing teeth for tearing flesh. One of the other attributes of sea otters is really uh, a limiting factor in their spread, their natural spread, and one of the considerations that we need to take into account in thinking about bringing them home, which is that sea otter moms raise only one pup at a time. They don't have a litter. River otters, by contrast, have three or four at a time, but these guys have only one otter, uh, one puppy, and the pup is born naive. They don't know anything. They're like a little cork floating on the top of the water, so the mothers have to teach them everything, how to dive, how to uh, catch food, how to open that food, how to groom themselves, how to be a sea otter. And in the process, that means that at least for the first year or so, a sea otter mom is eating for two. So she's at a caloric deficit almost all the time. Uh, she's got to dive just incessantly to get enough food to uh, feed herself, to keep up her lactation when she's uh, nursing, or to provide uh, food directly to the, her pup as well as herself because the pup's got to uh, eat and have its little metabolic furnace going as well. So what that means is that as long as there's food in the uh, available, prey available for the mom, she's not going anywhere. She's going to stay there and dive and get food. And so they don't migrate. They don't move very far. And this is a principal reason why natural repopulation into Oregon is unlikely. And we'll talk about that more down the line here. So we get questions all the time from people saying, hey, I saw some sea otters down at Brookings or uh, over in the, at Strawberry Hill or wherever. Uh, so the question is, is that a sea otter or a river otter? And this, my friends, is a river otter. Note how long that tail is. Note that it's up on land in the intertidal. And yes, River otters will feed in the intertidal. In fact, they may even swim around in the, in the water in the near shore zone, but uh, it's all uh, uh, at the very edge down to the water. And uh, whereas sea otters are out in the ocean and they may come ashore a little bit, but sea otters feed in the subtidal, not the intertidal. The other major difference just observationally is that sea otters tend to swim on their back. In fact, they always swim on their back. River otters, by contrast, swim on their tummy. Uh, sea otters uh, eat all their food. They do everything out in the water, whereas river otters come up on land to eat and uh, do their uh, a duty, as it were. So once these animals were here, and we know that there were approximately, or we, the estimate is that there were approximately 3,000 animals, 300,000 between Hokkaido, Japan, all the way across from Kamchatka Peninsula there, the Aleutian Islands down the west coast of North America, all the way down 
to uh, Baja, California in Mexico, in what is today Mexico. We know that they were here along the entire Oregon coast because all of the coastal language groups on the Oregon coast, the Native Americans, uh, had a word for sea otter in their vocabulary, and they were all different. So they weren't just copying each other. And as you can see, the Chinook at the north end there around the Columbia River, the word is ilaki, or as we say, alaka. But there were other uh, words for sea otter at, on, in all of the language groups down the coast. We also know that they were here through the stories that the elders told uh, and tell us today. And this is Annie Minor Peterson talking to uh, Melville Jacobs, uh, uh, telling stories of the, of the Coos uh, people uh, back in the 1930s. And those stories often refer to sea otter hunting or contain sea otters as mythic figures. There are also cultural practices uh, with sea otter pelts used as regalia and to show status and so on. We also know that they were here because of reports in a trade or news context. Robert Gray, uh, he who uh, hove into view uh, in the late 1700s looking for sea otter wealth, uh, reported them. Likewise, this account here in, in the Willamette Farmer from 1851 reporting uh, sea otters seen near the water in Port Orford. And then the Harper's Magazine there's an interesting article from 1856, uh, the part of which describes hunting for sea otters at Coos Bay. And this is kind of a fanciful engraved illustration about what that, where that might have been or what that might have looked like. And the way I estimate it based on the description in the story that it was in one of the little coves at the mouth of Coos Bay, of course, this is pre-jetties, uh, one of the little coves just about where the the uh, Boathouse Auditorium is for the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. Geographic place names of today reflect the um, uh, words from uh, coastal Indians in the past, Otter Rock and Lincoln County today. The word for that in Tillamook language means Sea Otter Rock. And in Curry County, the name for uh, what we know today as Otter Point, just north of the Rogue River, uh, was in Dene language, uh, also meant sea otter rock. And lastly, we know from physical evidence of bones and teeth found in the middens up and down the coast uh, that uh, they are the second most marine mammal found. So in the blink of an historical eye, they were gone. And this is really a rich and very fascinating part of the history of not just the United States, but the Pacific Northwest and what eventually became the coast of Oregon. And I, I would encourage you to delve into this because it's more complicated than I have time to tell. But the, the point is that beginning in the mid 1700s, 1741, uh, the China trade, trading, uh, taking uh, sea otter pelts and trading them to China spurred on Russian fur companies and their efforts across the North Pacific, southward to California. It brought the British to this region, the Spanish got into it, and of course, American companies out of Boston and New York, uh, governed really by no government except uh, going with the blessing of the brand new U.S. government, uh, all poured into this region and worked to harvest almost all, nearly all of the sea otters uh, through a, along the entire West Coast. So by the late 1800s, uh, they were gone. And even though Oregon was likely not a target of major fur hunting, and we, we know that because there are really no reports of sailing ships putting into any of the ports on the coast that we know today, uh, except at the Columbia River and a few at Port Orford. Uh, and there were likely because of the habitat distribution, even though there were animals along the entire coast, they were likely in not, not in large numbers. And by the time that uh, the fur trade was done, the remaining animals on the Oregon coast were killed by Indians 
who traded them to the incoming whites or by white settlers who knew where the animals could be found. These were depending on a lot on local knowledge to get pick off one, two, three animals at a time. And eventually, if you do that enough, it's going to make a difference. So the last recorded wild animal, uh, there's some differences uh, of opinion. There's uh, one was shot near Newport in 1910, but also one was shot near Port Orford in, in 1910, worth at that time $500, which is $13,000 today. So it was a big deal to obtain even one of these animals. The, the diagrams on the right, uh, and then the one on the, the lower one showing this tower along the shore is typical of what was used along the sandy shores up in Washington, and I'm assuming in Oregon too, where uh, in the late afternoon, somebody would get up there in the tower with a rifle and they could see the, the sea otters silhouetted in the waves offshore and uh, pick them off. And then depending on which way the current went, they would uh, set off and wait for the thing to drift into shore. So there were survivors, uh, even though by as the late uh, 1800s, they were functionally extinct across most of their range and in Oregon, a few animals remained at these isolated spots, including the ones closest to us were Prince William Sound up in Alaska and uh, down on the Big Sur coast in California. These remnant populations, probably um, less than several thousand in total, uh, are the basis for the foundation for recovery of sea otters throughout their range today. And today they're present, uh, the yellow here shows where they're present in some numbers, and the red is where they're still absent, including this 800 mile gap between the animals in California and the animals on, this, on the Olympic coast in Washington. And this is the 800 mile gap into which Oregon fits and into which we would like to return sea otters. So where are they today? Today they're in California and many of you have probably been down to the uh, central California coast to Monterey and on down and have seen them. They're uh, pretty cool. It's really quite a treat to see these things in the kelp around uh, the uh, Point Lobos and uh, into the Monterey and Monterey Bay. These animals are all descendants of the Big Sur survivors. There's a yellow little star thing right here. Uh, in the early 1900s, a population of animals of sea otters was quote unquote discovered, although the, the locals knew about it and uh, kept it quiet. But from that small population of about 30 animals, today that population is spread to the range you can see there, just north of of uh, Santa Cruz at uh, Point Año Nuevo and down just around the point at Conception, Point Conception down on the south. Interestingly enough, the population today is no longer expanding to the north or to the south. And the reason is sharks, uh, particularly on the north end. Uh, juvenile sharks uh, out looking for learning what's to eat um, frequently bite surfers. They frequently bite surfboards and they bite uh, sea otters themselves. But even though they don't hunt them and eat them, a bite to a sea otter is almost always fatal. So that's become a big deal. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, up in Washington, there's a population of animals of pushing 3,000 animals now, 2,500 to 3,000 animals up on the Olympic coast. Those were all a result of translocations from the Aleutian Islands, from Anchitka Island in 1969 and 1970. And they may likely have been, that population in 1970 may likely have been supplemented by animals emigrating northward from Oregon, from a failed relocation in Oregon that I'll talk about here. So today though, it's, it's gone from approximately 60 animals up to 2,700, but it's taken 50 years. We do see sometimes stray individual animals in Oregon, uh, likely drifting down, young males drifting down from the Olympic coast population. Like all young males, they're out looking for a good time and see what they can trouble they can get into. 
This one is photographed up Schofield Creek, which is a tributary to the Umpqua River at Reedsport. The guy photographed this off his deck. So this guy was really, this sea otter was definitely out of place, but it does show that these animals do move around as individuals at least. In uh, British Columbia, same thing. Animals were returned to Vancouver Island in 1969, 70, 71, and 72. Today, there's a population of about 500, excuse me, five to 6,000 animals along the northwest part of Vancouver Island and a few places up on the northwest coast. In Alaska, there are really considered to be three different populations out across the Aleutian Islands. That population was many of those animals were the source for uh, translocation to Oregon, to Washington, to British Columbia, and into Southeast Alaska. Uh, that population today is in decline primarily from predation by orcas that are out hunting for uh, food. And uh, sea otters uh, have suffered as a result. The Prince William Sound population there in blue has spread from Prince William Sound, but those animals, there was a remnant population in Prince William Sound but the area with the most animals is down at where the green area is there on the lower right in Southeast Alaska. And there's a reason for that. And that is that it is sea otter heaven. There's such a complex network of habitat. Uh, a, a sea otter mom looking for food or to needing to move on to find food can swim in almost any direction and find suitable habitat. that's relatively sheltered, it's relatively shallow. Uh, and it's rich in its uh, food uh, prey availability, as opposed to say in Oregon or California, uh, where it's a long straight coastline and uh, there's not a lot of shelter and um, it may not be possible to find food right away. But Southeast Alaska, yeah, there's a ton of sea otters now uh, in that area, probably 25 to 30,000 within this entire area which even though it looks small on the map is actually quite a large area uh, for sea otters. So yes, uh, sea otters were returned to Oregon very briefly. They, Oregon was one of the translocation sites in 1970 and 71, along with Southeast Alaska, British Columbia and the coast of Washington. And the idea was Amchitka Island in the Aleutians was uh, going to be ground zero for some underground atomic testing. And so US wildlife authorities and Alaska state authorities uh, moved animals out of there uh, and translocated them elsewhere. So in 1970, Oregon received 29 animals. They were released uh, near Redfish Rocks at Port Orford. And in June of 71, another 24 went into the Port Orford area and 40 were released they were supposed to go to near Cape Arago, but there was a big storm came up and they had to be dumped into the water before they got to Cape Arago. Uh, those animals survived in the area for about 10 years, but the population declined, even though pups were born, 15 pups in total were born. Uh, that population declined and by 1981, there was only one animal left and beyond that, uh, no natural, uh, population was found after that. We've learned a lot about animal handling techniques and about what it takes to introduce a number of sea otters and have them take hold as a population. But it seems as if, uh, and based on local reports and both here and then in other translocations, we've seen the same thing, that animals a lot of them just leave immediately. And the term is emigrate. They, they're headed for home. So uh, these animals emigrated and probably to the degree that even though the population hung on for a number of years, it was fundamentally below the level, the threshold for survival over the long term. So why do sea otters matter? Why is this even something that we want to undertake. Why all the fuss about this? Well, in two, there's two ways. The first is that they were a fundamental part of the life of coastal Indian tribes. They were um, respected and valued 
not just as fellow beings, but almost as relatives. Uh, the, the cultures, the, the, in many ways, you can think of it this way. Sea otters were here to greet human beings when they came across the, the land bridge <clears throat> from Eurasia uh, uh, to North America and then made their way down the west coast of North America. Sea otters were here, and that was only 15,000 years ago. So for that period of time, sea otters had been a huge part of the life of coastal Indian people. And it's that, that loss that uh, came at about the same time that Indian people themselves were taken from their life ways, their historical life ways, and moved to reservations and deprived of their culture. So we believe that it's a, a really important thing to reconnect sea otters with coastal Indian culture. A primary reason that we're interested in sea otters is the ecological aspect of it. Uh, and we'll go into this here now, but it's the ecological loss that we have suffered unknowingly. I mean, I grew up on the Oregon coast. I never even thought about sea otters. Nobody said a word about it. Uh, we'd had, we had no idea what we had lost when sea otters uh, were taken away by the late 1800s. That loss of sea otters shifted the ecological baseline of what we would consider normal. And we live with that loss today. Think of the watersheds. You know, people who arrive today and look at the Oregon coast and the watersheds think, oh, this is the forest. No, actually, it's not a forest. Uh, in many respects, they're tree plantations. And we've lost a lot uh, in the uh, ecosystem that uh, you and the watershed councils are trying to restore. So same thing in the ocean with the loss of sea otters. And that's because sea otters are a keystone species. A keystone is one that significantly and disproportionately affects the structure and function of the surrounding ecological community in, in ways that go far beyond its total numbers. And here's some other animals that do the same thing, including our friend, the beaver. So the fundamental realization of the role of uh, sea otters in the ecological processes of the near shore came in the early 1970s when a man named James Estes, as a young graduate student, um, ended up going to Amchitka Island to help with some of the translocation of sea otters as, and as well to begin his research work on the relationship between the environment uh, and uh, sea otters up there. And he said it took him about 30 seconds because on Amchitka Island, he, in diving in the water where sea otters were present, he saw these rich kelp forests and the productivity there. And it, when he went uh, it's a couple hundred miles away, but she, to Shemya Island, where there were no sea otters, the sea otters had not returned and dove all he saw were urchin barons, and the productivity was almost non-existent. And he said it was like a eureka moment for him. Jim Estes is still with us. He's still active. He's been a friend of our, our work in the science uh, of it. And, uh, but his foundational finding of the role of sea otters in promoting and protecting kelp forest has been uh, proven over and over again in study after study. And that's what the literature is based on. So why is this? Well, um, and I'm having, when sea otters are present, they, uh, because of their appetite, they're, they're going after, among other things, sea urchins. As, as sea urchins are calorie rich, they don't move a lot. Sea otters are uh, able to handle them easily, even though you and I probably would have difficulty. So when sea urchins are controlled, kelp forests can flourish. And when kelp forests flourish, biologic productivity is high. But when sea urchins, uh, when sea otters are absent, these urchins can multiply and eat. They graze on kelp, whether it's the big bull kelp or it's the smaller understory stuff. And uh, they just mow it down, resulting in these urchin barons. And as a result, biologic productivity is lost. In other words, these little urchins clear cut the forest. And 
Why do we care about kelp then? Because that's the fuel, that's the structure for the nearshore ecosystem. That's like saying, why do we care about coastal forests? Well, it's more than tree plantations. Uh, it's home for so many varieties of life. Uh, just as in a coastal upland forest, uh, uh, kelp forests slow the wind blowing by, in this case, the ocean currents. And in so doing that entrains eggs and larvae of many different species of shellfish and, and uh, finfish that are drifting along in the California current or the Davidson current and get entrained and, and sucked into these uh, kelp forests where they can survive A and B, provide food for uh, within that ecosystem and within that forest. So kelp forests are incredibly important. And without them, uh, all, all manner of uh, all parts of our coastal nearshore ecosystem suffers. So it is really a forest in the ocean. The major canopy forming kelps are the bull kelp here in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest down into California. Uh, in California, it's primarily the giant kelp. There is a, a patch of giant kelp at Cape Arago down near Coos Bay. So what we see on the surface with this, this little guy and this is what we see below. It's a whole nother world. And uh, I don't know about you, but I, I am not probably go, ever going to lay eyes on this in person. So I'm relying on imagery to tell me what's down there. So one of the hidden benefits that is, we're increasingly talking about is that kelp forests, because it grows so rapidly, it sucks a huge amount of carbon out of the atmosphere uh, to build the plant material. So studies have shown that, uh, that kelp can sequester about pushing 2,000 pounds an acre. So that's, uh, how much is that? That's a ton an acre, just about. Whereas without kelp, these urchin barons, it's 21 pounds per acre. So uh, there are, and if you think about that over the arc of all of the potential habitats along the West Coast where sea otters are missing, or kelp could come back, that's a big, uh, that could make a big dent in some of the carbon uh, sequestration concerns that we've all got. So beyond just internal to the nearshore ecosystem itself, sea otters benefit seabirds. And he's, these are some spectacular photos by John Bragg, who used to be uh, at South Slough National Western Research Reserve. And now that he's retired, he's hanging out at the beach with uh, his camera. And these are some great shots of birds uh, in and around kelp feeding on the, the productivity that results. So even when the, the kelp rack is blown up on the beach by winter storms, this rack brings those ocean nutrients up out of the, the, the marine environment, puts it on the beach where it's available for insects. Uh, it begins to decay. Shorebirds are attracted to the insects. Uh, peregrine falcons and other predators go after the shorebirds. Uh, studies have shown that these, uh, the kelp rack can even provide nutrients into the, what we would call the riparian habitat along the uh, uh, ocean margin and eventually up into the woods. Much like salmon bringing uh, ocean nutrients up into the watershed. So studies, recent studies in the last five or six years have shown that Eelgrass in estuaries benefits from the presence of sea otters. Typically, uh, sea otter uh, in estuaries, small sea slugs and snails graze on the algae of eelgrass beds. It's just like putting uh, snails into your aquarium at home. You want those snails to be eating the algae that uh, blooms on the glass and on the, the other little plants there. But without sea otters, small crabs eat all of those little critters, uh, leaving the algae to, to smother the eelgrass and prevent it from doing its thing. So when sea otters come along, they eat the small crabs and that enables the little grazers to do their job and results in uh, productive, healthy eelgrass beds. And more than that, uh, it's had a huge positive impact on water quality at least as demonstrated in Elkhorn Slough in, uh, that feeds into 
Monterey Bay in California. Uh, Elkhorn Slough is con contaminated upstream with a huge amount of agricultural runoff, but because of the presence of sea otters over the last 20 years, their water quality has actually increased. So uh, you all know about eelgrass and its importance as a habitat in coastal estuaries. So uh, we are, we're encouraged by these more recent findings that not only will kelp benefit, but estuaries and eelgrass will benefit. In Oregon, kelp coverage is highly limited and uh, highly variable. You can see in these three diagrams, here's Cape Blanco down by Port Orford, same Cape Blanco, Cape Blanco. In 96, this was the extent of kelp coverage. 98, it was this much. And in 99, was a banner year. So uh, what we've got is highly variable and limited, and we need to protect all that we've got. But because our ocean is warming, uh, that is, is affecting uh, the recovery of kelp and marine ecosystems everywhere along the entire West Coast and up into Alaska. It's thought that warming waters had a lot to do with the CSAR wasting disease that uh, caused a continental collapse in the uh, sea stars, both the intertidal ochre sea stars as well as these deep water pycnopodia, the sunflower stars that are the ones that predate on sea urchins. So what happened was uh, in 2013, uh, sea stars just basically got disappeared along the entire West Coast, which opened the field then for uh, sea urchins, just to, it, their populations exploded. And so even, this is an idea of what you're seeing, uh, at Port Orford on the left is a rock that was photographed in 2016 as part of gray whale studies. On the right is the same rock two years later where you could see sea urchins taking over, climbing up the stalks of the remaining kelp stalks and feeding on that. So it's a serious situation. Uh, Orford Reef, the largest uh, reef along the Oregon coast is nothing but a one large urchin barren these days. So we believe that there's a number of benefits from restoring sea otters. Uh, first, we'll talk just briefly about the cultural and economic benefits. We think that there's a, it's an opportunity to restore this uh, resilience and productivity for all marine life that feeds just all of the kinds of things we do here on the coast, whether it's commercial or recreational fishing, whether it's tourism or wildlife viewing, uh, as well as the cultural ties to the tribe. We also recognize and are concerned about some of the potential impacts uh, from bringing sea otters back, both on recreational and commercial crabbing and, and clamming. So we do draw some of our inspiration from the work to restore the California condor in this way. It's gonna take a while. It's going to take several more years, five, we don't know, maybe 10 years uh, to actually mount a translocation project. And it will be decades after that before there's a full recovery. In fact, there are probably many of us on this call tonight who are not going to live to see uh, the full recovery. It's gonna require cooperative effort among many. It's gonna involve uh, federal and state agencies, uh, a lot more scientific work, uh, analysis and understanding sustained adequate funding, and of course, you know, know about that, and it's going to require public support. So we're in this for the long haul. And as an, an organization, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing to try to make this real. Here's our board of directors, uh, nice mug shots all around. You may recognize the woman here uh, on the, uh, over towards the left, Renee Davis. She's uh, recently joined the board. She's the Assistant Director at the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, and probably you, have, some of you have worked with her. But we've got a great board, uh, including members from a number of the coastal tribes. So in 2019, we did a strategic plan, and out of that, we identified three principal tasks. The first is to assess the scientific and economic feasibility of 
restoring sea otters. The second is to help the region reach consensus on restoration. And by consensus, consensus we don't mean necessarily unanimity, uh, but rather a preponderance of folks thinking that, yes, this is a good idea. We need to move on it. If we can do these two things, then we will proceed with restoration in carefully chosen places along the coast. And I want to emphasize carefully chosen places. And I would say to you that there's, I think there's a, a, lot, a lot of speculation that if animals are brought back, suddenly there's going to be sea otters everywhere overnight. And the actuality is that there may be 100, perhaps 200 animals in some areas uh, after 25 or 30 years. But, and it will be much longer than that before they are, uh, their range spreads up and down the coast. So uh, our goal is to get them started someplace and let nature do its thing. And that's going to take a while. So one of the first things that we did, uh, that we've done, is to uh, contract with a great team of, of scientists to prepare a science-based feasibility study. And that feasibility study uh, has just been completed. It's not a, a decision document. It Rather, it's, it's to uh, help us and the agencies, stakeholders, and the public pull together all of the information so that we can identify, understand, and address the various factors relevant to restoring these animals. And I'm going to do a little trick here. I'm going to see if I can do this. I'm going to see if I can do this to make, see if we can go to our, uh, not gonna, nope, not gonna work. Oh, maybe it will. There it goes. So, yep, that's me. So Jim Bodkin worked for years in Alaska, USGS. He was on the team that helped write it. Here's Jim Estes, the guy I talked about earlier. He was part of our study team. Jan Hodder from down at University of Oregon, Institute for Marine Biology contributed. Sean Larson with the Seattle Aquarium, a geneticist and sea otter conservationist. Dr. Mike Murray from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, working on the veterinarian stuff. And Dr. Tim Tinker, is the, the principal author of the feasibility study. Tim has an entire career with hundreds, if not thousands of, of studies and papers that he's published on all aspects of sea otters and sea otter uh, ecology. Tim uh, was the principal author along with the others and uh, produced the draft report. I'm gonna continue here and we'll see what else we can do with this. So here's, here's some of the takeaways from the uh, feasibility study that reintroduction hey, are a successful conservation tool. Yes. Um, we're still looking at that last slide there right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well then let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to, to that. All right. It didn't, it didn't. I thought it would share what I was doing. Okay. Oh, so, there we go. All right, so the feasibility study itself, uh, go to our website, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute, that, uh, and you'll be able to delve into the feasibility study. So last week we had a symposium exploring a lot of the science issues uh, in the uh, feasibility study. Uh, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. All of those presentations were recorded. Uh, the other thing we've been doing over the last year or so, a couple of years, is a lot of community outreach and engagement, doing presentations much like we did tonight. Uh, we've, of course, pre-COVID, it was in person, as in here at the Saltwater Sportsman Show in Salem a, a year and a half ago. Uh, we've hired a director of community engagement an outreach to help us uh, put together a program to uh, work with people up and down the coast. Uh, during COVID, of course, uh, we've had to uh, resort to online work, uh, the webinars such as tonight. But we produce a monthly newsletter, and uh, which if you want to sign up for it, go to our website and you can do that. Currently, we are seeking a South Coast community liaison person to work in Coos and Curry County 
uh, down there because that's likely to be the area where uh, sea otters will be brought back first. So you can go to our website, Alaka, you can just Google Alaka Alliance or you can www.alakaalliance.org. Uh, it was our goal to make the world's best sea otter website. So there's a ton of information on there about sea otters, kelp ecosystems, and more. Uh, follow us on our social media, uh, at Alaka Alliance, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and our YouTube channel has all kinds of videos from previous symposia, as well as other recorded uh, webinars and presentations. So there's a ton of information out there for you on sea otters and the work that we're doing. Just quickly, uh, if you're interested, next week, a week from tonight, uh, Roy Lowe, who used to be the uh, refuge manager for the Oregon Coast uh, Wildlife Refuge is, on, is going to give a uh, webinar on birds and kelp. Uh, he's been a photographer ever since he retired and, and he's got some great uh, insights into the use of kelp by birds. And then stay tuned for this. We're working with, I think we were up to 15 breweries now around the state where uh, we've organized a Maris Otter Beer Challenge that coming this winter and early spring of next year. Uh, Maris Otter Malt is a malt that is favored by many of the small, smaller craft brewers. And so we've lined up a bunch of breweries to brew their idea of what a Maris Otter um, beer ought to be like that respects and acknowledges the importance of uh, sea otters in the marine environment. So that'll be a fun way to get into sea otters is with this beer challenge. And yes, there's probably a brewery near you. I know Pelican's involved. I think Fort George is involved. Uh, several others on the coast as well as Portland and Bend. So, uh, we hope to see you soon. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions, so fire away. I'm gonna pull up the chat here and kind of run through and see what questions we have in there. Um, we have a comment about the Nahalem Bay has eelgrass in it, but bull kelp only grows south of Cape Lookout. That is correct. Um, and how realistic is consensus with the fishing industry? How will you get their neutrality or support? You know, that's, that's the $64,000 question in many ways. Um, part of it is education. Uh, the fin fishing industry, particularly recreational fishers and those uh, who fish commercially near shore for fin fish, rockfish, uh, are going to benefit. I mean, those because that those species rely on healthy kelp forests, and when there's no kelp, they're not catching fish. So that's that's the first part of it. The second part with the crabbers is sea otters are not going to be everywhere. A, B, they are relatively shallow divers, and it's highly likely that very, there will be very little actual physical overlap between where sea otters live and dive and eat and where the majority of commercial uh, crabbing occurs. That's, but that's a, a difficult conversation because you know those guys are, are pretty protective of their industry and, and we get that. Uh, so, that's something that we've been working with, discussing with the uh, members of the fleet, the Dungeness Crab Commission, the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. A lot of us just dialogue and, and building that trust, uh, sharing information, and having people believe that, yeah, that's okay, we get that. Uh, that's a long road to hoe. Uh, in the end, there's always going to be people who are going to be opposed to this. I'm sure that you know, in everything in life, the most, sometimes the most obvious things, uh, there's people who just aren't going to go for it. So uh, we're going to do what we can to, to honestly and earnestly work with the, the seafood community. I tell you, one of the concerns I have is impacts on recreational fishers. 
or recreational crabbers and clamors in some of these some of the areas. You know, honestly, we're we're probably going to be looking at the southern Oregon coast as primary release sites. Coos Bay, South, Port Orford, Gold Beach, whatever. So, you know, a recreational clamming and crabbing in, in uh, Neetarts Bay or uh, Yaquina Bay or Nahalem, likely to never see a sea otter, uh, even, even Coos Bay. On the other hand, they could be at Coos Bay and that's gonna be a, an, an issue is because they will take uh, crab and they will take clams. We think that overall, because of the, the tendency of sea otters to eat uh, a wide range of crab, it's actually going to have a, a, benefit, a net benefit to the estuary. And what studies in, in uh, Adelcorn's flu have shown is that there has been no impact on Dungeness crab fisheries related to the uh, expansion of the sea otter population in Elkhorn Slough. Now, is that the same situation as Coos Bay or Umpqua or Bandon or wherever? I don't know, but uh, we think that that's, there are ways to work around it and to mitigate that or avoid most of the impacts. And, but we're simply not there yet to uh, decide on exactly where we're thinking about releasing animals and how many there will be. This is gonna be very, like everything on the Oregon coast, every watershed's different, uh, although they're similar. But everything, every community is different. And then same thing um, with offshore habitat. It's different everywhere. It's not uniform. So you have to get down to a fine grained level. That makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the, the very long term vision that you have is, uh, you know, it, it's the only way to, to get through that, that kind of issue. Um, we have. Let me just say one more. more. Yeah, go ahead. Right now, particularly on the South Coast, but it's true on the North too, there's a lot of alarm in the recreational in particular, but also the commercial fishing industry who, and urchin dive community because of the spread of urchin loss of kelp forests. And there's really no solution to that on the horizon other than over the long term bringing sea otters back we can't bank on bringing back these sunflower sea stars that they may or may not we hope they come back uh, but hand removal of sea urchins is not feasible at a mass scale so over the long term i think people are going to have to come to grips with either having no kelp forests because of urchin barrens or having sea otters back and having healthy kelp forests, fin fisheries, but maybe not the abundance of shellfish that we're all accustomed to. Um, the next question is, the South Coast has less over tourism than we do. Are conversations starting about otters helping increase tourism economic development? Absolutely, absolutely. That's. Uh, there's several individuals and companies, uh, as well as the Oregon Coast Visitors Association, where uh, one of our, well, our uh, community relations and outreach person was just at their convention this week, annual conference talking about uh, sea otters. And there's great excitement down there about um, having uh, sea otters back because of the, the boost to tourism. Um it fits with their, with the, there's an effort in Southern Coos and Curry counties to really promote the wild coast of Oregon. Uh, and the, you know, the number of wilderness areas, the wild and scenic Elk River, the Chetco, the Rogue, uh, the Sixes. And so in many respects, having sea otters back would fit right into that. The, uh, the scenic Nehalem as well now, as of last year, year before. Um, so we have a question. What about Garibaldi as urchin control? I've seen numerous docs showing them removing urchins from kelp beds. Is the success of the Newport Dungeness fishery 
related to the absence of sea otters is the com is, is the completion is the completion of Bay Ocean oh, natatorium. natatorium. Yeah, I did, and the official extinction mm. of sea, Oregon sea otters a coincidence. There, oh, there's a lot there. A lot there. Uh, uh, what about Garibaldi as urchin control? Garibaldi as in the fish? Or everybody in the city of Garibaldi going up <laughs> and uh, with urchins? I don't know about if it's, and I'm assuming you mean Garibaldi the fish, I don't know about them, uh, I, and I don't know how how that would be. I've never heard that as a particular solution. Uh, so, if somebody, Greg, if you want to uh, give me more information, I'd be I can respond. But um, is the success of the Newport Dungeness fishery related to the absence of sea otters? Let me say this: it's clear that whether it's the abalone fishery that boomed in California in the uh, early 1900s through the mid 19, or actually late 1900s, and the boom of, in red urchin fisheries in Northern California and Southern Oregon coast in the 1980s and 90s. And the boom, uh, those were related to the absence of sea otters. Those created the conditions for an artificial abundance of those targeted species. Dungeness crab is, may or may not be related to that, but likely not. The more I've learned about crab, these things spawn in the millions up and down the coast. Uh, anyway, there's a guy named Alan Shanks, who's an emeritus professor from University of Oregon Institute for Marine Biology, who has studied Dungeness crab his entire professional career. And he just says, you know, the way that crabs populate, uh, spawn, mature, spread, uh, there's almost nothing you can do to, uh, to kill that population. And it's probably natural. If you wanted to uh, actually learn more about Dungeness crab, Alan gave a great talk at, the, uh, at our symposium last week. And you can go to our YouTube channel and check it out. It's only you know, 30 minutes long or so, and you'll learn a lot. So the natatorium at Bay Ocean. Uh, there's no direct connection, but I would just say this, that the completion of that natatorium, in fact, the whole Bay Ocean experience was based on a certain level of ignorance about the way the, the coast really works, the, pro, the natural processes that are in play. And in that case, it was also the result of the fact that the North Jetty at, at Tillamook Bay was built prior to that and totally altered the uh, currents coming around the tip of that that caused erosion of ocean, Bay Ocean Spit. So, so there was a level of ignorance about how the coast really works and how you need to fit into that. Similarly with uh, sea otters, it was just a commodity. It was just, an, it was just they were little fur balls with fur to be harvested. There was no thought no consideration, no understanding, and no care about them as a piece of an ecosystem. In fact, no, people didn't know what an ecosystem was. So I would say those things are not directly related, but they're part of the same sort of uh, syndrome of the lack of understanding and trying to commodify a piece of the natural environment uh, in a way that was just doomed to failure. Um, oh, here we go. Great. Yeah, Get there we are. Fish, pick up juvenile urchins and swim them to a ledge and drop them off into the deep. Well, good for them. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, I've not heard of Garib. You know, they, it's part of, probably going to be one of those pieces of the natural regulatory suite of regulatory mechanisms around sea urchins that if there was a normal population would contribute to their keeping them under control. But I, have, I sea otters just, they, they make all the difference in the world. They can just completely change an ecosystem in the course of a year or so. So Garibaldi may contribute to that as well as sunflowers, sunflower sea stars and so on. But it's gonna be sea otters over the long term that have to be back. 
Um, so a question I have for you. Yes, sir. Is in the context of sea urchin booms cause a uh, deforestation for a better word, a decultification right. of an area um, and, the, and, and the otters really need that kelp present as, as part of their habitat structure. Um, as you're looking to restore sea otters to an area that has rocky habitat, mm -hmm. um, so much of our area up here is, is really sandy, but right. in, in, in those rocky habitats, um, what comes first, the, <laughs> the otter or the kelp, right? right. Like how do you, egg. yeah. Yeah, good question. And that's come up a lot. And the answer seems to be that we will want to pick areas where there are at least remnant patches of kelp. Uh, areas where there are lots of sea, of uh, the urchin barrens, yeah, those will, those eventually will be converted back. Uh, I mean, the, the otters will eat around the edges, uh, but we'll probably want to pick areas, for instance, at Rogue Reef, just uh, off the mouth of the Rogue River. The kelp beds down there seem relatively intact. The kelp beds at Cape Arago seem relatively intact even though Orford Reef and Blanco Reef right off Cape Blanco have been hammered and a couple of the other areas. So we're, we're gonna want to be looking at areas where there is at least some kelp habitat, uh, as well as the potential for more as sea otters inhabit the area. But it really is kind of a chicken and egg thing. We're not quite there yet in terms of actually identifying that site, but because we need to do a little bit more field work uh, as in, let's get in the water and go scope it out. Uh, so that's some of the next things we need to do. Does that answer your question? That definitely does. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yep. Yeah, it, uh, guys in California studying the patchiness of kelp and urchin barrens down off the, uh, in Monterey. It shows that even though sea otters don't necessarily go into the urchin barrens and tackle the urchins that have basically no uni, no nutritional caloric value. Mm -hmm. They work around the edges. And the kelp can survive up on the pinnacles of the top of rocks and urchins will come up to them. Um, and so it, kelp can be more patchy than you might otherwise expect. But it's... Uh, probably going to be the case where, urch where it's going to take some storm events to tear out a bunch of these de uh, depleted urchins. It's going to take, um, who knows, the unexpected in the marine environment uh, to help sea otters along. But once they get going, uh, it's clear that they can flip the, the, that particular part of the ecosystem from urchin dominated to kelp dominated um, within a year or two. Pretty incredible. It is incredible. It's yeah. just, and all of these little animals, as I say, they're about the size of a German shepherd dog. I mean, I could you conceive of yourself out there floating around 365 days a year in the ocean? I can't. So, I mean, God, it's, it's totally impressive what they can do. So, um, do we have any uh, any other questions from folks or comments? Well, minutes here. You know, part of what inspired me to reach out to you folks is I was looking into um, near shore habitat use by juvenile salmonids that were out migrating, mm -hmm. and um, how helpful in areas where kelp beds do exist, they are to juvenile salmonids for that out migration as a place to move into gain a bit more size mm -hmm. before transitioning out into the open ocean ecosystem. Um, oh, here's another question here. But yeah, so that's, that was part of how I got here was thinking okay. about that and then wanting to talk to people about how, how a how kelp establishes in general. Um, we have another question here. Uh, Nadia asks, 
How do kelp restoration efforts connect with your efforts? That's a good question, Nadia, thanks. Uh, we're working with folks down in Port Orford, the Oregon Kelp Alliance, who actually has some research sites up on the North Coast at, around uh, Haystack Rock, Pacific City, and uh, South Face at Cape Lookout. Um, we think that what they, uh, the, the Orca folks are doing, which is to remove some uh, in selected research patterns, uh, patches, removing all urchins, and then monitoring the return of kelp, the growth of kelp. Now, bull kelp and its kin are annuals. So this overwintering, these little, whatever they're called, spor sporophores or gametophytes or something, settle out and land. And by you know early February, March, as the daylight is starting to come back, they're starting to grow. And they can take off within, you know, they grow from the bottom, you know, 60 feet to the surface in the course of a couple months. So, I mean, it's phenomenal. So what they're doing is opening up some of these patches to see, kind of help to gauge the ability of kelp to regrow in these areas, which we're fully supportive of and think that's a great thing to do because if we can establish that these limited that these patches can in fact regrow kelp, those are the areas that you might think about bringing sea otters back to as sort of seed areas. So that there are, those are some of those anchor points for sea otters to then branch out and spread out from there and work their way into the rest of the urchin barrens. Uh, we'll see if that, if that technique works. You know, it's clear that whether it's in Port Orford it's down, or down at Fort Bragg or wherever, hand removal of sea urchins over a significant enough area to flip an ecosystem, it's just not doable. It's, I mean, you can't organize enough divers and do it often enough to make a difference. But we, we do think that these uh, uh, restoration efforts, even in their experimental design, can be very useful for us in thinking about where sea otters, we might want to release sea otters. Uh, you said something a minute ago, Zach. I want near shore habitat and its use by juvenile salmonids. Yeah, that's been shown to be yeah pretty clear and rogue yeah. reef off the mouth of the Rogue River. Yep. The, you know the fish coming out of there wanting to hang a right and swim north, they're going to end up in in uh, Orford Reef and Blanco Reef uh, as well. And so yeah, uh, the Indians. Uh, from the region knew that perfectly well that uh, it's uh, was home to you know smolts well they're be, they're beyond smoltification at that point they're yeah really, they've gone through it that yeah, they've gone through that so but that's a, an environment for them to get their sea legs before they take off for the big world yeah how they interact with um kelp forests as opposed to uh some of those more surf environments um they have different residence times in those spaces before going out to the open ocean and, and, and kind of traveling the gyre, mm -hmm. um, which may or may not relate in some ways to, you know, at, at sea survival. It's, a, it's another opportunity to gain some size and some weight and yeah. the old adage of the big fish eat the little ones, yeah. you know, it's there, yeah. so. Um, well, part of, part of at least my personal attitude is we can't, I, I don't, I think it's, I think it's folly to try to pick and choose the parts of the ecosystem we, we choose to, to keep or to restore. You need them all. Mm -hmm. If you're truly going to do it. Yes, we can think about, well, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just do that? No, we need the entire thing. We need all parts of it. And that, my friends, includes sea otters. Uh, and we're all, as a society going to benefit from bringing them back and in 25 years we're going to be glad that we did and we're all going to wonder what the fuss was about uh, because the benefits are going to be just terrific and it will it will help to restore the kinds of things that the Oregon coast ought to be in terms of its productivity and the the, the web of life 
that is there to be recreated. And that goes from the watershed, like you say, all the mm -hmm. way down to the kelp forest and off into the big wide Northeast Pacific Ocean. It's all one thing. And we can't, we can't leave out key parts of it. Exactly. Um, yeah, I can get real biblical about this whole thing. I mean, I, I, I just resisted going off on the explanation of why the Watershed Council talks so much about coho as a, as a species to target because they use so many different parts of the watershed in so many different ways that if you protect all life stages and life histories of coho, right. you're essentially doing work in everything from the bay all the way up into, right. um, I mean, even beyond anadromy up into, you know, beaver dams that are at the headwaters mm -hmm. and little ponds mm -hmm. formed behind landslides and all that, all of that factors into coho survival. Yes, it does. So it's, yeah, it's all a big, it's all a great big web with a lot of pieces to, to, to pay attention to. It needs to be a, cohesive yeah. picture not just uh picking and choosing little spots you know when i was growing up in in north bend and i had family friends that had different you know, they either worked for logging companies or in one case <clears throat> they owned a big chunk of land up Kentucky that was a family-owned logging operation for a couple generations and you know nobody thought about woody debris in the streams in fact get it out of there because you know a it's just plugging things up and it's going to wash out the road if it backs up. Yep. And now we're putting um, logs back in the streams. We're, we want that woody debris. And for a long time, we didn't think that was the right thing to do, but now we know better. Yeah, I ran into a guy who used to work on, on the logging crews up in this area. And he was, we, I was out for a hike and he was telling me about how uh, he used to drive a bulldozer down some of the streams in the area because that was what his job was to do was just to take his bulldozer and run right down down the stream bed clear out all that wood make it a nice shoot i've got um, a i've got a cousin <laughs> in peace bay who who <clears throat> i think he's not doing it anymore because he's a little older than i am but for years he ran a, a log log truck company out of coos bay mm -hmm. and he said you know i used to just do nothing but haul logs out of the woods and he said you know I've made the, my living over the last 10 or 15 years hauling logs back upstream and because he has a self-loader. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Side right to where they need to be. He, I he's, love hiring a self-loader. <laughs> we just never knew knew what we were doing. Yep. No, exactly it. Um, Greg says nature does not compromise. All components must be intact and functioning. And yeah. I completely agree. Yep. Completely agree. Could not agree more. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we can uh, call it an evening. I'm sure we could sit here and talk about this stuff for another hour or two even, but, you know, um, if we aren't have any more questions here, then I just want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, thanks, yeah. Bob, for your talk. Uh, everyone should go visit the Alaka Alliance website and... Um, you can visit the, the Lower Nahalem Watershed Council's website too. We're going to be uh, actually making some improvements to it here okay. in the near future. And um, yeah, hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zach, very much. I appreciate everybody sticking around too. That's been great. Thanks and good night. Good night.